I'll run you through kind of what's going on. It's all about efficiencies today and how we start to build in that into our systems, okay? So I tend to move around a little bit, so um, if I get in the way of the screen, I will move just shortly. Be patient. So anyway, um, as we get going here, if you can think of a hydronics or a mechanical room, kind of as we see our, our own body, you've got our, what I would reference as the lungs as that regeneration equipment or that that uh, that piece that, that gives energy, okay? It's how we put or infuse oxygen into our blood vessels to go on and then um, make our muscles work. So if we can think of that, we then call the heartbeat of the system that pump or that circulator. Okay, and I think if we just kind of think in, in terms of context like that, it really helps us to understand what needs to go on. So what I want to talk about today is maximizing efficiency. For too many years, what we've seen happen is systems built, we've got large generation equipment that's got great efficiencies. The problem thereafter is once it's installed, we can really diminish what those systems are capable of doing. So what we want to talk about is really how do we how do we look at that generation equipment and how do we incorporate it into adding the efficiency component to things. So we can have great set of lungs. If we don't have a heart, we're dead. <laughs> I mean it's it's really hard to really hard to function. Same sort of thing. We can build a great system, but if we if we don't move that energy around efficiently, then we're really no further ahead than maybe the equipment that was in there previously. Okay, so what we want to talk about today is the transition we're seeing right now from split capacitor motors. Now I tend, uh, just, just for record, I tend to play much more in the, um, I'll say residential realm, that large light commercial into that. So we'll talk about things that, that contain drives and we'll talk about uh, those pieces. But really at the, at the end of it, it's all about variable speed. The how we get there may change a little bit, but from a concept of variable speed, that's what we'll try and land on, okay? So right now the industry is in a transition from what we know as a PSC or permanent split capacitor motor, and it's moving to now ECM. This is something that's going to change rather rapidly in, in our world, in, in the circulator world. Uh, we've seen ECM motors that are in play in the, you know, in all of our industries for quite some time now. You know, our furnaces, our air handlers, blowers of that nature, larger capacity motors, higher horsepower motors have all engaged things, whether it be a true ECM or it be a byproduct of, um, let's say, a variable speed drive. So there's, there's a few aspects in which we can do things. But ECM stands for an electronically commutated motor. Okay, it's known in our industry also as a brushless DC. Um, that's the difference in what we see. So we've started, we've, we've moved into this realm in a very, very big way. Most products, anything being designed right now is all on the platform of these high efficiency motors. So those days of, you know, high efficiency AC motors are gone. We're moving to something that can that can better encapsulate, we can take data from, we can learn from, we can speed up, slow down, have inputs to. And we'll talk about the importance of that piece here momentarily. So what is an ECM? Well, electronically commutated motor, as I said, the big pieces of which you get is we can create the same work or do the same work, typically with half the wattage, okay, half the power, right out of the box. And that's generally before we even start talking about you know, now the variable speed aspect of it. So ECM is a, is a high efficiency product. They work very well with very little energy. So when we look and talk about maybe some of the things that we can harness off those motors, we can put a little board in there that says, okay, we're going to measure this or we're going to do this part. We can speed up based on this known fact. And so there's a lot of data and pieces that we can drive into this that make them smart. Where has the industry been? Well, in our world, we talk about pump curves all the time. And a pump curve is something that is generally, it's a fixed, um, you know, it, it's physics. It's when we build these things, we put them together, we run water through them, we start to add resistance to them, and things happen on the, on the physics side of things, we can start to build a curve. 
And in that curve over the years, we've basically arrived at, well, it's one speed and go. And so we've tried to best select things that made sense. Often they were going to put us into an opportunity where we were going to over pump. And in the case where we were over pumping fluids, now we were also delivering too much BTUs. Okay. So doing that had a lot of adverse effects, but most importantly, it just meant inefficiencies. So now we can start to look at, okay, how do we build on this? How do we get away from just a single speed opportunity and now do things with drives or smaller ECMs? So, so when we look at a product like this, this is, this is very simply stated. This is a, a pump curve. So what we see through the screen here is this is physics. So we built, when this, that product was built, there was certain hydraulics components that said we will get so much flow based on so much resistance. And we built a line. And that pump curve is always going to be that pump curve. It can't change. Okay? Now we put it in, we put it in play into a system. And we put a, a system imprint or like a fingerprint on that pump curve and we get what's called a system curve. That system curve is going to intersect with the pump curve and wherever that happens, that's what you are going to get, okay? So, think about this. When we design things, what do we design them for? We design them so we don't freeze, right? I mean, it's designed for worst case scenario. It's designed that on the coldest day of the year, we meet conditions that maybe it said, hey, we want a 72 or we want 21, whatever our numbers, whatever we, we want to talk in, in terms of uh, uh, values. But we had a number in mind when we put it together. So now we start playing off of that a little bit and things start to change. So when we size a pump, we size a circulator, you know, we've got to do the math. The math is very important. It, it helps us begin the building blocks. And those building blocks are, okay, well, how much flow do we need? Based on how much flow, what size pipe can we put it through? What are the values and the, the resistances we see in either balancing valves or fittings and all of those pieces? So they all come into play. And with that, we start to gain knowledge. We start to build a picture. And with that, you know, or the starting point in that rather, is that formula. That's the universal hydronics formula. Every piece starts with that. And it basically says, our GPM, and that's kind of our known at this point, but we want to figure out what that is. So we take our known BTU load after we've done our heat loss, and we divide that by the delta T times 500. And we don't have time to get into all of these pieces today, but that universal hydronics formula is the crux to everything. What changes today is now we have variable speeds. So if things are going to change, not necessarily are we were looking for GPM anymore, but we want to see what are the efficiencies we're going to build around. And if we designed in this building, let's say a 20 degree delta, right, differential in temperature from what we deliver into what we get back at the boiler, if we design around that with variable speeds, our GPM floats. So let's measure now our GPM and we can look at the known. And through that, if we just simple trig and we can change this formula around a little bit. What do we get in delta T, right? So what's this piece now become? And that's, that I think is where everything starts to, to evolve here. If we can understand what that delta T is and how it impacts things. Remember, if we design for 20 and we're only getting 10, well, we're 50% the efficiency of what we designed for. So these are important pieces, right? I have to state it because these are these are some of the conversations I have with people when they call up and it's like, no, you gotta do the numbers. This isn't a guessing game. So it's do the math. At the end of the day, when we don't do the math and we make incorrect selections and things like, I'll just say where we were as an industry as when you selected something and all you had was the opportunity to pick one point on a curve and at zero input, then over pumping occurred. And with overpumping occurs short cycling. It's the inevitable piece that it just it just is. Okay, short cycling is what? It's poor. It's bad on equipment. 
We never get into our true efficiencies if we don't have proper run times on equipment. If we're just on and off, we're going through that life cycle quicker. Okay? All of these pieces are great reasons to use variable speed products. So the why. I probably just kicked off a few of those. But, you know, from a technology aspect, we have the technology now. We can do this. Now we just ask everybody else to engage and start to look at the opportunities, okay? Um, key to maximizing the, the, uh, the system efficiency. Guys, if we've got 97% equipment, we might as well take all 97%. If we do things and we drive that efficiency to 79, 80, we're no further ahead than the equipment was there, right? So it's, it's have the discussions. It really is, think about these. If you're, if you're from an engineering firm here, it's all the pieces that come together and, and, and the why we do it. So have the discussions with manufacturers. Understand how we can have input to things. Certainly from a, an electrical component, as they made that one analogy, you know, we can have a circulator that's, that's 80 watts. And we can have another circulator that would be an ECM circulator. That thing could be 40 watts. And that's running at full speed. We'll do a little example here because I want to just show you kind of in the math how those numbers shake out. But there's, <laughs> there's some really good reasons why. So Taco is a manufacturer, and I had a question earlier. Um, we are a company called Taco. It's the thermal appliance company. We've often been referred to as the Taco guys. Or what are we having for lunch if we do a lunch and learn? But um, it is the thermal appliance company. And right now in our industry, Taco is the most invested company in terms of putting resources and dollars and R&D into driving the ECM offerings that we have. So we have that widest selection of ECM offerings in the industry at this point in time. We have stuff that's going to do the small residential through to snow melts, through to the bigger commercial pieces that are going to drive towers, that are going to drive large snow melts, that are going to drive parking garage ramps, and all of those pieces. We have all of those. Um, jumped one screen too far. So we have all of those pieces. And ECM, or whether we'd be, we'd be putting a high-efficiency motor with a drive to create those efficiencies, there's a number of ways we can do it. At the end of the day, it's let's make it simple. Because also this does a couple things. This, this enables um, selections to be something that then also, you know, it's a single selection. And if you made that selection before, what happens when it got to the job site and there were variables involved, right? To then have to balance and throttle and add more resistance onto something, it kind of took away from what we were trying to do about being efficient. So in a case like this, now we can have a single selection and now we can start to dial these things in and have them perform where we want them to perform. In this example here, pretty simple heating system. Okay, we've got three zones on this. It's, it's operated with zone valves. Uh, we've got a ModCon boiler, and that ModCon boiler is teed into that, uh, uh, that piping, okay, on, on the secondary. And so kind of an injection type look at this. It's not necessarily the slide in, in terms of the layout of it, but what I want to talk to you about is more from the, the performance curve that I show up here. Again, if we go back and said, okay, what we've been doing over the years is picking a single speed circulator. And when we put a, 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 a system curve against it, we would see lines, okay, if this was a system curve, we would see or pardon me, this is the pump curve, we see these system curves representing, let's just say these three zones, and we could pick these, these three lines here, okay? As a zone valve is satisfied, okay, room has enough BTUs put into it, as, they, as the zone is now satisfied and that thermostat turns off, then we see the opportunity for a zone to close. When that zone closes, what happens to flow in the other two zones? We see an increase, don't we? We see a spike in that because suddenly we're trying to put enough flow for three zones through two zones. And so we see a spike. So what happens? Remember, this pump curve is fixed. 
And so if we take this point here, where we were intersecting and operating that circulator on that pump curve, once that zone closes, we climb up the pump curve. And we would do it again when that next zone closes. So you, you begin to add resistance. You begin to see greater velocities going on. Greater velocities mean erosion. Greater velocities mean people here, <laughs> water flowing. Um, greater velocities or greater pressures mean zone valves fail prematurely. Higher head pressures to shut off against. All of these things. Do you know what our band-aid over the years has been? Well, we'll just put a pressure differential bypass in. And that differential bypass really was a means to, to loop and make a shortcut from the supply back to the return. If there was too much flow, a spring valve opened up and it allowed that hot water to come back. What did we just do? We just threw energy away, right? We just took hot water back to a boiler and what did today's boilers want? Cold water. The operating efficiencies from today's boilers and condensing boilers come from getting the coldest water, having that greatest band or that biggest delta T. So, where we go next, we'll skip through just a couple here. So basically what we've done here is said, okay, you know what, variable speed works really good on that secondary type of system. When we talk about boilers and we talk about what, what really makes them tick, most manufacturers say, you know what, we want to fix speed through that. Don't play with our modulation, give us fixed speed, let us then figure out how the boiler modulates. We have to respect that, we'll work with them. I would say in most cases we'll go with fixed speed. There are opportunities whether we go, um, you want to put a BMS or tie a DC signal to a building management system or have some input, right, and vision to, uh, to be able to see what's going on in the system, then we can interlock those pieces. But until then, we'll take the manufacturer's side, we'll just say, you know what, respect the manufacturer wish for that boiler and, and go with probably a fixed speed. So, um, let me back up one more here. I just I want to say in where we're going, and I think this will come into play again in, in a moment here. But as we said, the system curves will always go and move up to intersect with the pump curves. Ultimately, what we want to get to when we're talking about ECM products and the, the ability to, to change speeds, a constant pressure mode makes a lot of sense. Okay, and it really creates what we call is a flat line. That curve becomes flat. And we'll show you how we do it, but essentially, the product slows down. Okay, so some electrical data. Again, I'm kind of from that residential world. I'm gonna to talk to you just a quick little example, but it's all just horsepower. It means we just add bigger numbers, right? We'll just have to add bigger values to things. But if we talk in terms of a typical system, and this is, again, understand this is taking circulator A, circulator B, and we're going to put them on a, on a bench test, and we're going to run them. I just happened to build a little bit of a scenario in here, okay? But at the end of the day, this is only talking about electrical savings to make that circulator turn, okay? So, in this case here, the example is five permanent split capacitor circulators. Let's perceive they're about 80 watts each. Okay, that's a 400 watt total. If we look at getting that to kilowatts, just divide it by a thousand, what about now we want to get to kilowatt hours? So we're gonna take this one here, we're going to then times by an operating hours, and there's a lot of tables out there in which we use here in North America that says, okay, as we move north and south, we kind of run equipment for these sort of times. So there's tables out there that say, in this band here, we're about 2,500 run hours during a normal heating season. So we want to find out what that looks like, okay? So we'll take our, our kilowatt hours, we're going to then times it by that 2,500, and we're going to get to that 1,000 kilowatt hours. If we take 23 cents, I just kind of rough my bill out and go, okay, all in, delivered, charges, all of that stuff. 23 cents is cheap some places, and it's really expensive in other places across Canada just the way it is. But to run five circulators, 230 bucks a year. Okay, big deal. Let's rethink that. 
Let's talk today as, you know, ECM circulators. Let's look at a few different scenarios. What if we did that same job with zone valves? Well, we still need to circ to drive it, so we can still look at a traditional circulator to move that water. We got five valves that are going to open and close, allowing the same same system uh, response as before. But now we get down to 87 watts. Work the math out. Comes down to 50 bucks a year. Huh? Not bad, right? We were 230. We're 50 bucks now. That's a pretty good change. But I have those guys in the industry that go, yeah, but Sean, I don't like zone valves. You'd sooner just do it with circulators. Okay. You know what? There's both schools. Both schools and both are right. Both get to do what they want to do. Well, let's, learn, let's look at this thing again. Let's go, okay, five ECM circulators. And these are modulating. Okay, so I could look at an average operating point and say that's 20 watts. We worked that through 57 bucks. All right. Fair enough. Here's the thing I think we got to do. When we work in homes, when we work for our customers to do things and design things, we really need to look at what is the best for them. Too often we go, this is good for us. I got it at the right price. We've designed it. We've we put it together. All is good, right? What about the operating costs over the life expectancy of that product? What do they get to burden? And this is, I think, where as, as industry, we have to think more and more about this piece. So what if we did that with, again, a circ? We'll go with these uh, zone sentry valves. And now we get down to, right, these, these are the lowest power draw uh, zone valve on the market. You've got the uh, a circulator that's a really low power draw. We've just gone from 230 bucks, which may be the system that's coming out, to something we can do that's under 16 bucks at the end of the year to operate. We didn't even talk on the impact of the boiler. Because remember, if we start to play on those system curves and we start to figure out how the other, um, or sorry, play on the pump curves and figure out how the system curve intersects that, there's going to be impact on those boilers and the performance aspect of that. So now you bring a gas bill or, or whatever other energy piece you're doing into play. So let's just talk kind of the, the tail of the tape and I'll build this around this W15. This is a circulator that's a three setting circulator, okay? In our industry here, most, most installers, most designers are familiar with three speeds. What if we said it's three setting? So what we do here is we, we take a, a low setting and it said, okay, that's five foot ahead constant pressure, right? We don't get to act on just this pump curve anymore. Now we get the ability to move up and down, okay? And we'll show, we'll show how that happens. But in these settings, five foot ahead constant pressure, 10 foot ahead constant pressure, and then we have a full speed setting, okay? But you can see how that plays out. So I took that 20 watts, is kind of playing in around here. As an average on that, that mid setting, it's great for just about any rent residential home in which we're going to encounter here in this, uh, in this marketplace. Um, made it very simple, easy to install. Okay. It's, it's just three simple settings. The variable speed components though, let's kind of hash those out. When we look at how the curves operate, remember variable speed, but let's always look at what's the worst case scenario. We've got to make sure we have that covered off. So if that top end performance curve is good and is going to cover off that load and, and what we need, then, hey, great selection. What we have the ability to do with a constant pressure mode is now when that circulator turns on, it says, okay, where am I going to find what I'm set at? And so in this realm, it's going to go, okay, I'm going to land here. It's 10 foot ahead constant pressure or whatever, guys, we, we can take this example and put it against anything, okay? What's going to happen though now, anytime we have a system change, we can create a new pump curve. In this case here, there could be like 40 pump curves. We're gonna reposition the operating point on that circulator, okay, and, and how it works. So as soon as it sees a zone close, no need for sending energy there anymore. Rather than ramp up and begin to, you know, now push the efficiencies out, change that delta T we talked about in the beginning. Rather than impact the delta T and the performance of that boiler generation equipment, 
Now we just slowed down. So we didn't, in fact, impact that. Well, not adversely anyway. We did from a, from a positive side as we slowed down the speed at which that, that product was moving water or fluid through the system. And it happens over and over and over. So we can take something and rather than see a pump curve, you know, go out here and then ride this top end line all the way up for inefficiency, we flatline it and we can now start to slow it down with everything that changes in our system. And that's something that, that can carry right on through. So, so in most cases, we'll talk about minimum RPMs, we'll talk about minimum power consumption, we'll talk about a minimum base point on a lot of, a lot of these things. But, you know, that's, that's for another class. So, in terms of wattage, again, just to sort of benchmark what we see on here, 44 watts at the high speed. 30 watts as we start to slide down. Again, this, is, this might represent four zones, right? We've got all four zones operating, but as we start to satisfy and shut down, we can see how those wattage, gone from an 80 watt circulator down to maybe 17 watts. This is all good. This is stuff we as an industry need to be excited about. It changes customers. It changes their expectations. It changes what we can provide as, as techs, as engineers, as everybody in this. So that would be how we would see that at 10 foot of head constant pressure. What if we looked at 5 foot of head constant pressure? Well, we get the same sort of deal. As that curve or as that product slows down and comes down to meet the different intersections on that constant pressure line, we see the reduced wattage, okay? And that would go right on through. Some of the neat things we talked about just capabilities, and I'm gonna be very specific to this 0015 circulator, but some of the things we talk about with this one, um, the pieces we can harness, the pieces that we could never do before. You know, we're gonna look at what's going on in the system. We're gonna give you mode lights that say, okay, this is what's happening. You know, uh, an orange light would signify a constant pressure mode and everything's good in your world. A white light, well, it says, hey, something's up here. We can't quite get a good measurable on things. And that white light would be a bit of a flashing sequence, okay, just, just drawing attention to it. So I would say as a, as a technician on site when commissioning and when setting this up, what's cool about that white light is it, it's sort of like, it's sort of like we, we put another contractor on site with them Say, okay, you go purge this thing and watch it and get that air out while I'm doing other stuff. And so it's, a, it's, it's an enhancement. It's a really nice piece that will actually auto purge the air all by itself. And as long as that light's flashing, what's happening in a circulator is it's hitting full speed, it's stopping. It's going full speed, it's stopping. It's what we would do in the industry, kind of opening and closing a valve to try and break an airlock, okay? So red light means, hey, we got an issue. Like uh, Houston, there's a problem, all right? Um, that means that circulator, rather than sit there and run till it, it burns something out, that product now has the ability to, uh, um, to actually stop and go into a safety mode. So some pretty neat, uh, neat things that way. When we looked at our locked rotor position, you know, we've all seen things in systems or heard of things in systems that really shouldn't be there and they can jam on an impeller and they can stop performance of a product. If that happens, this one has the ability actually to oscillate. And by oscillate, it really means we can take that impeller rather than just drive and sit in a locked position. We have the ability to rock this thing back and forth. Whether it be system impurities, whether it be tape, solder, gunk, whatever we've seen, we've, we've, we've heard of it all. Um, but we have the ability to get rid of that stuff and break free. So that will go through these mode lights, and again, after 100 times, it's just going to lock out and, and say, hey, we need somebody to come in and see that. Um, in this case here, there's a whole other piece, and if you guys ever get a, an opportunity to do a course, again, this one I think will impact your systems as much as a circulator will, but it's air elimination, and too little is given to what a good air eliminator will do in a system. So uh, if we just talk about this one, I, I kind of spoke to the language and the wording on this one, but it's, it will speed up and slow down, and it will finally just uh, 
you know, it'll try indefinitely, okay? But it'll always go through that mode. So somebody will know before they leave that job site that something's up. So I'd like to just talk on sort of the opportunities as I close up here as, as my alarm's going off and, and Kelly gave me the, the one minute warning. Um, when we look at, again, you think of boiler rooms, you think of mechanical rooms, we have to think of, you know, how we move the efficiencies beyond that. We can tank that thing really quickly. We can kill the efficiencies of it really quickly. So let's look beyond that. Let's really try to drive um, efficiencies at that point. All jobs are opportunities these days for it. You know, pricing is, is, is out there. Um, in some cases, it's, it's still a little bit higher, but, you know, work with them. It's well worth the, the opportunity. Strata groups are all eager to save energy. Um, homeowners, you know, reduced energy is just is music to their ears. So, so get out there, ask questions, learn. There's all kinds of courses on this stuff. There's many manufacturers involved. Certainly come see us at TACO. We've got, uh, I put our website up there. We've got some great information on it. And, um, you know, there's some great learning environments on there. So thank you. I appreciate your time. I hope there's some takeaway from this. And um, I'm certainly all hang around here at the side. And uh, if there's any questions, we can we can talk there. So, all right. Thank you. <laughs>